Welcome to the Pixie Dust Podcast. My name is Ashwini and I am your host. The goal of this podcast is to inspire the next generation of founders. This is our first episode. It's so exciting. I have been enjoying myself so much putting together all of these amazing episodes for you guys to listen to. But before we get started, I wanted to give a little bit of a background and kind of a little bit of a story time where I tell you guys about what inspired this podcast. I've always wanted to be an entrepreneur. It's definitely been something that I've kind of always envisioned myself being. Um, I grew up in the Silicon Valley, so I'm no stranger to entrepreneurship, but I've never really spoken to other people who are in very similar stages as myself who are either in the very early stages of company building um, or like myself who are still in that ideation phase and still broadening their network and introducing themselves to the world of entrepreneurship. So one of my steps to and like basically enter the entrepreneurship world was to dip my toe in, start making friends, start networking with other entrepreneurs and other people who are interested in entrepreneurship. That way, not only can I learn more about what they do and have, you know, a strong network for when I actually have something that I'd like to execute on, but also so that I can learn and identify whether entrepreneurship is a good fit for me and whether it's the path I want to follow. So while I was having these conversations and cold emailing people to talk to, um, I realized that a lot of my questions that I'm asking, I think a lot of other people also would like to know the answers to. So I thought, why don't I start this podcast to help inform other entrepreneurs like myself? Because I think at the end of the day, entrepreneurship should be kind of a level playing ground for everybody. So yeah, Um, today we have Jessica, who is an incredible, incredible engineer and entrepreneur. Um, that I met along this journey. She, like us, is an aspiring entrepreneur um, and is currently working on an idea that is in its early stages. And I'm so excited to share our conversation. Not only is she incredibly eloquent, but she has some amazing ideas to share with us and I learned a ton from her. So I hope you do too. Hi, Jessica. It's so nice to see you. Um, Thank you so much for being on this episode of the podcast. I'm so excited to hear about your perspective as a fellow aspiring entrepreneur. I'd love to hear a little bit more about your experience, your background, and what led you to be interested in entrepreneurship. Yeah, I'd love to tell you about that. So uh, about my background, I've been a professional in the tech industry for about nine and a half years. I'm currently working at Intuit on the Uh, technology futures team as a principal software engineer. I've only been there for about a month. So just to be super clear, I'm not speaking on behalf of Intuit and everything I say is personal about my personal opinion. So that's set aside over there. Um, Before I joined Intuit, I've mostly been at startups uh, in Silicon Valley. So the last startup I was at was building a no-code platform for the Internet of Things and a kind of universal operating system for the Internet of Things that allowed non-engineers to put out apps and experiences that really interacted with the physical world in a new way. That was really cool. Uh, But before that, I was at another startup that did e-commerce subscription boxes for baby stuff, the way that Stitch Fix or Dollar Shave Club would put out a monthly box for people. We did that for baby stuff, which was really cool. That was called Citrus Lane, which was acquired by Care.com at one point. And before that, my first job in tech was at Kabam, which is a social gaming company that was at the time based in Redwood Shores. But before I got my job at Kabam, I spent a little over a year teaching myself how to code while I was living at my parents' house, which I was lucky to be able to do. And I was working as a waitress at Chili's and the way that I started trying to code was super random, but it ended up being exactly what I wanted to do and what I wanted to learn. And I worked on uh, just from home, an, an idea that my brother came up with for a language learning website called the Polyglot Project, where people would read books in different languages, and we would use the Google Translate API to pull in the translation to your native language uh, whenever you came across a word you didn't know, and we would keep track of the words you didn't know so you could come back to practice them. And I didn't know what I was doing at all when I was making it, but it worked, and we put it out there, and that was enough for people to start interviewing me for a job. But before I tried to learn how to code, I actually studied human development in college with a focus on early childhood education or early childhood. 
as an age range of focus. And uh, that major was really about covering a broad range of social sciences and humanities. And it was a really great major for someone like me who is overly curious and cannot commit to a single thing. So the fact that it was human development and psychology and sociology and history and philosophy and all of these great topics was exactly what I wanted. And um, I think that when I joined tech, I really liked being at startups and smaller companies because I'm a big systems thinker and at startups, the entire system, including the entire business is still knowable. You can really know how the whole thing works. And if you get there early enough, you can see it grow and see it change over time. It also gives you a lot of opportunity for growth because there's only so many people at the company and there's so much work that needs to get done that if you're willing to step up and do something you've never done before, you will have a chance to do that and kind of flex and stretch into new places and see you know, try your hand at different things. And it, that I really liked because it didn't depend on credentialism or training. You kind of get to try out your intuition, right? Your first, my first time being a product owner was really based in my uh, skills and interests that I had just developed by being someone who loved software and loved software development. So then it was like, this is what happens if I try to be a product manager. And so I think that kind of curiosity for different experiences really has a lot to do with what entrepreneurship is. It's like, well, what if I try this now? <laughs> what if I do this? And I think that I was also able to get a really close look at how entrepreneurship works, which wasn't something that I had growing up. Most people that I knew back home who started a company, it was much more just, oh, I worked at a firm that did this thing. And now I've started my own firm doing that same thing. They weren't necessarily inventing something new or put, putting out a new product or trying to solve a problem in a new way. Uh, you know, So I, I didn't have that many working examples of that. And being at startups, I got much more experience and exposure to people who thought about problems that way. And that was really interesting to me. Um, I didn't see entrepreneurship in myself during it until quite recently, but I knew that I was a really good executor of ideas for people. So I, I, I actually am very happy that I spent the first nine and a half years executing other people's ideas because that kind of took the idea ideation part off my plate and I could focus on, okay, here's how we get from where we are to where we need to be. And that's a really big skill set. But I did start to get frustrated that I was like, well, if I have all these skills, I would like to use them on something of mine. And that's really when things changed in the last year. You struck on a very interesting point, which is that entrepreneurs think in a different way. They're identifying problems and they're, they have like a specific kind of mindset. And I'm working to learn more about that, but what are some ways that you went about learning more about how entrepreneurs think so that you can adopt those strategies yourself? Yeah, um, besides working with entrepreneurs, which is part of it, and, and you do see that they do think about problems differently. I, it's almost that entrepreneurs are more irritable about problems, right? They get more annoyed by things that don't live up to their expectations. They're a bit dissatisfied with everything, but then there's, almost this audacity to think what, like that should be better and I might be able to make that better. That's, that's a, a little bit of a leap that I had to take. But beyond that, beyond learning that from the entrepreneurs who were, who were around while I was doing this work, I like to watch interviews of, and read books about great entrepreneurs, but not just entrepreneurs, also activists or kind of big systems thinkers who set out to change things because I think that audacity is part of it, like seeing problems, being mad about them or annoyed by them, or at least opportunistic about them, and then trying to figure out how you could set out to change it. Entrepreneurs, activists, and kind of big systems thinkers are, are those people. So watching interviews with them, um, reading books about them, that's all very enlightening. But I have kind of a rule for myself that I don't want to make heroes of people because people are really imperfect, right? And we need to be able to have kind of imperfect heroes. So, you know, if I'm watching something about Steve Jobs, I like to think, okay, this is what, this is what worked about Steve Jobs. This is how he was able to create things. And I try to put aside some aspects of the way that he interacted with the world that I don't think are as positive and say, you know what, I'm, I'm not going to attribute his success to him treating people this way. I, I have to believe there's a different way to do this. Um, and so take the good, leave the bad, or take, what, take what's for you, leave what's not for you. Um, 
And you know, you can learn from that. But I would also caution that you can spend way too much time consuming videos or interviews or books about other people's entrepreneurship. At some point you should set that aside and and figure out your own path because it it shouldn't look like anybody else's. It should be really tied to you and the problem you're trying to solve and how you're trying to solve it and what's important to you and your morals and your values and things. Like don't assume that your path is going to look like anybody else's. It can be just for you. And then maybe somebody will write a book about it someday. And then maybe that path will be one of the paths that somebody will look at and think like, that's a good path. I want to do something like that. If you're one of these people who haven't met a lot of entrepreneurs or haven't had the startup experience you've had, what are some mm-hmm. tips that you have for broadening their network or helping them reach out to people who might um, be able to help them? What I, what I have found is that people seem to underestimate their network, actually. Um, if you think everybody has 24 hours in the day, you know so many people, all of them are out doing something, right? They're meeting other people, they're reading, they're interested in things. So when I, ha- when I encounter something I haven't done before that I'm going to need to do, I, put a, I think of casting a pretty wide net. Either I could post something on Twitter, I could post something on LinkedIn, or I could just think, okay, I need to do this. What do I know anyone who's done this before? Or do I know anyone who probably knows someone who has done this before? Or sometimes it's that I don't even know what that thing is called. And I just need to say, Hey, what's it called when you need to find someone who does this, this, and this for you. And I've never had an issue so far finding somebody in my network who knows at least something to get me to the next step. I think that's really what building things and entrepreneurship any kind of change making is about is just you have what you have you're at step a you need to get to step b what what can you what little advances what incremental step can you take um in connecting with somebody or asking for help that you can get to the next bit even if step b might be 10 increments away just keep moving toward it right um and you don't have be really strategic about what you choose to spend time learning versus what you choose to spend money paying somebody who already knows about that thing to do. Because there's a lot of things that will go into some of the entrepreneurship that I'm working on in my uh, spare time where I have to do things I've never done before. And I know, okay, I could spend a couple of weeks getting good at that thing, or I could just go find someone who's already good at that thing and kind of empower them to help me uh, with this and pay them. And, and it's, it's just a trade-off you have to make. But I've never come across, nobody I've ever asked for help has ever said no, not once. And I, it really, you do that a couple of times and you stop being scared of asking for help because you see that you're not going to get all the no's that you anticipated. And it makes sense if you think about, at least for me in myself, I know that I almost never say no when someone asks me for help. I'm, you know, I, it feels good to help people and to be generous with your knowledge and be generous with your network. It's one of the reasons you build a network is not just to help yourself, but to have this pool of resources available for other people that you want to support. So yeah, just kind of ask and just start poking around at your network and saying, hey, this is what I need. Anybody have anything here? And that has always worked really hard, really well for me. And I haven't had to try that hard. I've been surprised that I haven't had to try that hard at that part. Yeah, I mean, even in my experience, very few people have ever said no to me. I think the main thing that for me personally, I had to overcome was that fear of putting myself out there. I always had kind of in the very beginning, I kind of thought, oh, if I just post something, no one will respond. No one will think, no one will, or they'll they'll know I don't know what I'm doing or they'll know I need help with this. Once mm-hmm. I posted it, I was, I got people messaging and offering to help and connecting with some people. And I was like, oh, okay. So this is, this is how this works. You know, one thing I found was that there are certain platforms that if I post things on, I get more more traction, or there's certain relationships that if you foster, it makes more sense to reach out via email than on LinkedIn. I think that's a very personal thing, depending on your network and the quality of your connections, Mm -hmm. but completely agree. It's just about putting yourself out there and trying it and figuring out what the right person is for you too, because, you know, you might need people, for example, if you're looking for a mentor or looking for advisors, like, you don't want to go with the first couple of people, right? You want to make sure that you really spread out a wide net and meet the right people who are good matches for you. And if you're growing your team, you also want to do that. You don't want to settle for like the first two people who come around because I mean, they may be the right people, but you want to make sure you're convinced of that 
before that's to right. move forward. Yeah. That's right. Absolutely. And I've found that nobody else can ever convince me of something like that. I have to convince myself of it. And mm -hmm. I have a pretty high bar for being convinced of certain things. And um, it's actually funny. It, when I've been recruited for other jobs, I there was a specific person I would be put in touch with who was, you could tell they were sent to convince me to join. And if they sold too hard, I was like, mm, 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 no, no, that's not going to work. And then it was only when I met somebody who felt like they were talking more down to earth about it that I was like, okay, now, now I feel like I know something true about this opportunity or this situation. And that was something that I then allowed myself to become convinced by. But I, I think you're totally right. You can cast a wide net and you can be choosy about, especially about your team, you don't have to be choosy necessarily about where you get um, input from, right? Or mm -hmm. where, who introduces you to the next person. But when you say build a team, yeah, the, the team you build is going to make or break what you do. So I, there's very few things you need to be more careful about than who you end up working with. And that, that goes down to everything. That's who, who's building with you, who's designing with you, who's funding you, who's advising you, your board, your mentors. That's all re really important and part of your path, like your specific path is finding your specific team. Absolutely. When, when, let's rewind a little bit to the sure. very beginning while you were ideating and figuring out kind of where you wanted to start your entrepreneurial journey. What are some questions you asked? How did you start the ideation process? So for me, ideation is not a process I chose to start. To me, what you do is you kind of load up your brain with reading and, and consumption, basically, reading videos, uh, concepts, news, journalism, anything like that. Also, my all of my education, all of my technical background, those are all things that were just kind of swimming around in my brain. And it's it really, for me, it happened someday when I finally kind of let all of the busy work of life get quiet enough that I just had time to kind of think and synthesize the information and all those things that I uniquely had brought together in my mind. And all of a sudden it hit me that there was a problem that was really important, that I cared about, that I knew a lot about, and that I thought was critical to solve, and that I might actually have the tools to do it. That I kind of was waiting for someone else <laughs> to come along and fix it for me because I do want it fixed, but if I didn't have to do anything, I would have sort of preferred that. But I was like, oh no, what if it's me? <laughs> what if I have to step up and do something, right? And, or it's not going to get fixed. Am I just going to sit here while that problem doesn't get fixed? And uh, that was, it was, I, I say that it's, it was sort of like getting hit by lightning. It was like, oh, oh wow. And it was so exciting because then the ideas start flowing really quickly. I had to start taking notes very quickly, even like using a dictation app to, to get it all down in the speed that my brain was moving. And then I would come back and make sense of it later. And all of a sudden I saw this path, this path from where I am now and the tools that I have now to this version of success where I think I might be able to make a dent in that problem in, an, in a unique way that I haven't heard anybody talking about yet, but I believe that it's good. And when I saw that path and saw that I might be able to pull it off, at first I was very excited and then very quickly, boom, I'm scared. <laughs> because, because the problem's important to me, suddenly I felt very responsible. Like if I don't do this and that problem persists, I'm going to feel really bad if I end up feeling like I could have done something about it. So I ended up calling a friend of mine who was, um, who's someone who has been an inventor and entrepreneur for his whole life, basically. And I told him, I, I was like, okay, let me just lay out what just happened. This, I told the same story about the idea storm coming in and, and all of this and, and that, oh no, now I'm scared. What, what do I do? What do I do next? What's the next thing? And the question that came out to him I, was, I asked, what if I'm not the right person, right? What if I'm not the one who's supposed to do this? And this was such a helpful thing to me that he told me. He told me that that question had never ever crossed his mind in his entire life about whether or not he was the right person to do this. And what he said was, you're the right person if you do it, right? If, if you don't do it, maybe somebody else will show up and try, but maybe not. Maybe nobody will show up and try. And maybe if you do it, um, 
somebody else might show up and try, but they won't do it the same way that you're going to do it. And they won't have the exact same, you know, brain and ideas and thinking about that solution that you do. So it won't be the same. And you doing it your way is a unique thing for the world. And it might be the right thing for the world. And you don't know that unless you just do it. And maybe no one will ever show up and, and try it themselves. So that was a really, really pivotal moment for me to be like, oh, okay, I can set aside that question because I'm the right person to do it if I'm the person who does it. Exactly. I think that we're each so different in the way that we approach problems, like just inherently, just because of our backgrounds and where we come from and what we studied, as you mentioned, you have like your wide range of experience. So you'll use all of that when you come, to, when you comes around to putting together your, your product and your solution. I think that's what sets everyone apart. And once I had that rec that realization, I think I actually became much more comfortable sharing ideas that I had because I was like, well, I have my passions and my toolkit and some ideas that I have just don't fit my toolkit or mm -hmm. don't like make me feel very inspired or interested in solving. But at the same time, I want them solved. Like, I would like this to exist, you know? <laughs> so like, let me put that out there, manifest it. Hopefully someone out there will hear me and they will strike that lightning in them and then we'll have that product out there, you know? Yes. And I think, I think that's a very different approach. I think once people realize that they're unique and they bring something special to the table, um, they become more open with their ideas and more collaborative because at the end of the day, innovation is a, like a, mutual thing. We're all working towards this goal. There's not just a handful of people driving innovation forward. Everybody has something to contribute. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I want to know, do you feel comfortable sharing ideas? I feel possessive of exactly one idea that is like no, the exactly. idea yeah, yeah. that I'm going Your to bring into the world. <laughs> that's, <laughs> yeah, exactly. that's the one that I, people will know about. And some people do know about it, but you know, I think very deeply about who to share it with. Sharing your idea with some people, with trusted people, what I would think of as my inner circle or my kind of personal team, right? Um, these circles of, of friends and family members and mentors and people I trust, you know, I know that they're not about to quit their jobs to go try to build the thing. Like they know what it would mean to like compete with me on that. So I don't think they're <laughs> about to go do it. So it's really helpful to talk through your ideas with them to, because you do want feedback, right? You want to you know, dip your toe in and say, is this anything? Would you use this? Would you like this? Do you, do you see how I could go about building this? So you want to have people that you trust that you can share the ideas you're most possessive about. But every other idea, and I have a lot of ideas around software because I'm, so I'm a big user experience person. I've loved computers and the internet and software from the moment I had them. And I know the feeling of good software and I know the feeling of good human and user centric designed software. And there's a lot of pieces of software that I use every day. And I'm like, I just want this one thing to be different because then I would love this software, right? Then I could like, let me love this software, please. So sometimes if it's a pre-existing piece of software, I'll actually write to the people who make it and just to give them suggestions, I'll say, hey, this is a point of friction. If you fix this, if you made it work this way instead, I would love that and I think it would work better. Or, you know, bug reports actually work really well for that. Uh, sometimes it gets a little bit more extensive where I can tell that they've made something that I really want to work, but they're missing something fundamental about the human on the other end using their product. And I'm like, okay, I can kind of try to reorient them around like the experience of that end user and who that person is and the choices they're making sort of from more of a behavioral science point of view. I think that's, that's a piece that's really missing in a lot of software development. And then there's actually broad brand new ideas for brand new things that don't exist yet that I still like to think about what should that how should that work? What, what is the right interface for like a thermostat or something? Because I, I don't like the way they work right now. I, I, there's, I just want to say into the air that I'm too hot or I'm too cold and then have my house learn what to do. And I don't want to think about the numbers and I don't want to have to program anything, you know, and I would love for someone to go build that because I want that to exist, but I, that's not what I'm going to build. And so I'm happy to just put those out into the ether and see I, I literally will tell people, if you build this, I will pay for it. <laughs> I will buy that. Like I promise. And I know other people who would too. And then uh, beyond that, I also really like to talk to 
uh, companies who are starting new projects, especially social software. That's something I think about a lot um, about how they're approaching the problems they're trying to solve and the different aspects of user experience that are making their way into their software. Because I, I just want a good tech future to exist. I, I want a good internet. I want good products out there that really serve people's needs. And I think that my uh, expertise and experience tells me like, some things that people are missing. I'm happy to talk to people about how to make their thing better because I do just want it to be better, but I don't want to have to build everything. I have a, a different thing to go build. I think one thing that I personally have experienced and I know many other aspiring entrepreneurs feel the same way is that we're told innovation is just that we need to disrupt the market, that we need to come up with this most amazing idea that's so different and groundbreaking and like completely revolutionizes everything. Do you think that even exists? Like, what are your thoughts on that? <laughs> no, that's a really great question. I, and I've thought about this a lot. I've had a lot of conversations about this because um, I think that one thing that really helped me start thinking in a more entrepreneurial way was kind of reading and thinking and learning about the ways that invention actually happens. And most of it is incremental. Most of it, there's, there was all this work, step after step after step over the course of years and years, decades, sometimes done by academics, sometimes done by amateurs, but you know, everybody's just progressing you know, down this path. And then suddenly there's a one, say someone takes one more small step and suddenly there's a phase shift right? Where, where something explodes. And then it looks like that thing was the big invention, but people don't realize that the, it was actually just the last step. So that's how I feel about the internet. That's how I feel about smartphones. That's how I feel about the telephone or the printing press, right? Everything was kind of building up bit by bit. And it's really helpful to know that that's actually how invention happens, right? Um, a lot of companies, they were built by um, built after e-commerce kind of started to settle down on the internet. And the question became, well, what can someone do with all this e-commerce software that exists in the world that Amazon can't? And one of the answers was, well, curation. You could curate a box of things to send to someone because then they're not just like having to browse for specific items on Amazon. And that idea, I believe, has probably made billions of dollars, right? Just curation of things, right? But it's just one little tweak to the way e-commerce works. And then that became a subscription. And now there's so many subscription models out there. And so you can see that people are just like turning a, a little knob a little way and just adding one more thing to the last thing. And there's a lot you can do just with that. And I think people might get stuck thinking that they have to reinvent the wheel. There's a reason that that's the thing. Don't reinvent the wheel, but you could make a slightly better wheel perhaps, but you know, don't go back to square one on that. I guess I'm curious when, when we're doing that, right? When we're tweaking, it seems like people are already using the previous one. How do you know that you're making an improvement that people would navigate away from the existing solution to hmm. this new solution? How do you convince yourself that the tweak is enough? Well, you don't necessarily know, right? Everything, you, everything you're doing as an entrepreneur is kind of an experiment. You are, right. it's best, I found it's best if you are trying to solve a real problem. If there's a real gap that you see that exists, that means that people should want that gap to be filled. It's something that actually bothers people. There's a lot of software and products get, that get made that are solving nothing. And then they don't, they, they do have an audience, but then they, I don't know, they, I'm not that inspired by that version of development. That, that seems so rooted in just what's possible and what you can do rather than what you should do and what problems need solving. And I don't find that that compelling really. Um, it's easy to see how you can piece together different pieces of software and make a new thing happen. That's, that's very different from looking for problems first and looking at humans first and looking at the world and saying, uh, I don't think we're all very happy with the way some of this works. What could we do differently? And another good trick for this is to build something that you need, right? So literally what I'm going to end up building is something that I find myself wishing I had. And then that tells me that at least for sure there is one user <laughs> waiting to use this product because it's me and because I would have it and use it deeply for a real problem that I have, that means that I will know when my problem is solved, right? I will be able to recognize a good solution because I have a real problem that needs solving. So 
that's kind of how I think about that. Those are a few shortcuts, but one of the key things there that is really helpful about problem focus rather than solution focus is it helps you not get attached to any one solution. The solution is the experiment, right? It's a hypothesis. It's saying, maybe this works, right? And if you put it out there, it turns out that it doesn't solve it for people or it doesn't solve it for enough people for your taste, which you can solve something for a small group of people. I think that's also a big distraction is the idea that every startup has to be like a unicorn that makes $10 billion and has to do all of this within the first year. That seems kind of made up to me. I, I know that it's made up amongst many. I know that sometimes you get funded and that's the expectation, but you know, I think also you could say, no, this one's going to grow a bit slower. I'm really just starting a small business. I'm just trying to pay for a house or you know, keep, get some income going. That's totally fine. And it's just, maybe you have to find a different type of person to back you in that endeavor. And um, you know, so, so it's, you can, you can, choose a lot more granularly what kind of problem, what scale you're trying to do. Not everything has to go be a, a unicorn and not everything has to make billionaires out of people. Um, you know, you can solve a problem for a small, um, especially an underserved community. There are so few products that get built for underserved communities. And th those are totally markets sitting there. And just because certain people don't see it, that doesn't mean it's not worth doing. So that you can really find a lot of problems that need solving um, just by expanding who you talk to about how they feel about how things are going out in the world. I think you touched on something very important at the very end there where it's about who you talk to. I think the entrepreneur mindset for a large part it's just listening to people and talking mm -hmm. to people and asking questions to get to the root mm -hmm. of why they feel the way they do. Because mm -hmm. it's so important to actually get to the problem. Right. A lot of the time people will say, oh, I wish this was the case. I wish this was the case. And they're proposing a solution, which may not be the actual That's right. solution. It That's may be right. their specific solution. So by pushing a little bit farther in and asking them, why do you want that? Or what will that solution do for you? you can identify the problem. And if you hear that from enough people, then you might get an idea of, oh, this problem exists. This is a space I can enter. And I am uniquely positioned to solve that. Mm -hmm. If that is the case, then I think that you're in a good spot to start delving a little deeper into that and exploring kind of how you would do that and whether you're passionate about solving that problem. In my mind, that's the outline I use for you know, ideation and problem identification. And I think it's also crucial to approach it that way because you hear and you develop a network of people who have that problem, which makes them perfect to support you as you're building it out and giving feedback. I think that's crucial too, because sometimes if you create a full-fledged product with what you envision to be the right case, then you hear from users that that's not what they wanted. That can be very devastating. And at, at, at some points it can cost a lot of money to fix too. So it's very important to have that iterative process. Um, mm -hmm from the very beginning. Absolutely, I think you're dead on right about that. And yes, getting feedback early enough is really important to make sure you're not spinning your wheels or, or going too far down a track um, that isn't going to get you where, where you need to be. And where you need to be should be about that problem being solved. Or like I said before, putting a dent in that problem, like contributing to the solution of that um, problem. And yes, who you talk to is critical. One thing that I've been thinking a lot about, and I say this as a programmer who is deep into Silicon Valley in my career, programmers are really overrepresented in the grand scheme of startup founders. And I think a lot of that comes from the fact that when you're writing code, it's you get really technically literate and you then become really familiar with what solutions are available. And you say, okay, if I pull together this from AWS and this open source project and this thing, and I piece them together, I can make this thing, which has never existed before. And then if that thing that you can make can make money, people are, there are so many pipelines and systems that are ready to say, we will fund you for that. And that's kind of okay sometimes. Sometimes that works out okay. But often that thing that they made is either a solution to nothing, like that's not, it's not actually solving a problem or it's solving a very, very niche pro problem. And those problems tend to be problems that software engineers have or people in Silicon Valley have. And that's really such a small subset of the whole world that I feel like so much is left on the table. And you know, we're kind of 
over specializing our products and services and ideas around this specific type of user who is extra um, technically literate compared to the rest of the population and spends a lot more time on their devices and has an entirely different relationship to technology than most do. And I think what else that does, let's, rather than framing this negatively, I would say the positive thing about starting from a problem and really caring about that problem and really getting to know that problem very well. What, like, what is this problem? How does it function? What does it cost people? Who does it cost? How important is it to solve? What, you know, really understanding a problem in depth. You might not even turn to technical solutions at first, right? You can turn to history. You can turn to human development and sociology and psychology or philosophy. And you can say, you know, we, we have this problem with communication, right? Communication seems really tough these days. People are fighting with each other. People are getting canceled. People are really, communication seems a bit busted. And you could say, okay, well, how do I make software to improve communication? Okay, well, that's one way to start. You could also go back to um, past learnings about how did we improve people's ability to do things in the past? Sometimes that's education. Sometimes it's literacy. Like literacy changed the world, right? So maybe there's some sort of communication literacy or emotional literacy or human literacy that you could improve. And you're not thinking about, oh, let me twiddle the knobs on some piece of software to make this better. Let's like, oh, let's reduce latency. Let's use push notifications, which are so interrupting and terrible for our attention anyway. But you could go back and say, okay, what if emotional literacy is the answer. How can I build software that fosters that for people? And it's then you might think of it not as I want everyone to use the software forever, but this software is a learning tool. It's a tool to help people like discover what skills they had inside them the whole time, not to be like a hero movie, but you know, our brain and our, um, our minds and our connections with other people contain everything we need, right? In certain ways, right? It was conversation and communication with which built societies, right? Like patient communication. So what, it, what are we missing now? Because I, when I'm talking with certain people on social media, I'm like, I don't think this kind of, this conversation could necessarily like build something together. But maybe right. it could if we just figured out, well, what kind of communication does allow that? And that's the problem. I, ha you, I haven't become attached to a single solution yet, but I could pick and choose how I solve that problem from basically anywhere. And software is just one of the tools in the toolkit. And so that's the way that I think about software is more as a medium than as the solution itself. It's, to me, it's a little bit weird to presuppose that tech is the solution, but it's Absolutely. a solution. Absolutely. I think no, exactly. You make a very strong point, which is that there's so many different kinds of businesses that have made change in the world and have innovated, and they're not all in tech. You know, mm -hmm. some of them are in education. Some of them are conferences. Some of right. them help you unlock your potential by giving you subscription puzzles. There's so many different types of services in the world that are all identifying, all addressing different kinds of problems. Mm -hmm. And by going high level first and identifying what problem really motivates you and exists in the world, mm -hmm. then you can figure out and hypothesize what the right approach to toggle would be, right? Yes. You could say, I think I should solve it this way and mm -hmm. I'm uniquely suited to do that. Or I can build a team that's uniquely suited to do that. And then I can toggle and we can try this way. And if that mm -hmm. doesn't work, you're still addressing this problem. So you can pivot, you can try another, mm -hmm. another approach. And that's the beauty of entrepreneurship is you're really, you and your small team are really the ones calling the shots and trying to figure out how mm -hmm. to solve the problem. You know, there's no, there's just like a ton of wrong answers, but there also is just a ton of right answers too. You don't know. Mm -hmm. And that's the beauty of it. Yeah. And there's different right answers for different populations too. So if right. you formed, let's say a company, not around a product, not around a specific solution, but around solving a specific problem, there's no reason that you couldn't have three or four different solutions for different people that are all trying to address the same problem, but have different business models, different products, different solutions that are adapted to say, no, I'm going to take a number of 
you know, takes at this and see what works. And, you know, as you grow and you have more resources, that's one thing you can do. You could go broad on solving a problem rather than go really deep on one solution. And I just find that thinking only about solutions doesn't let you get there. What I see when, when a company starts that is very solution focused, I think that they tend to half fix a problem and then they're attached to their solution. So they don't, change it enough to fully fix the problem. And then, but then they have all these engineers, they have all this money, they have all this, these resources. And they're like, okay, I'm going to go half fix a different problem now. It's like, uh, let's stick with this. Like, let's, let's stick with this and not be so in love with this solution. Let's see what, what else is there so that we can really solve this problem. And so I'm, that's one thing I'm really trying to encourage for other people. That's the way I'm thinking about it. Everything I'm saying, I'm going to practice what I preach in everything I build. This is the way I'm thinking about the problem I want to solve. I don't know that I have the one solution. I have a first try, um, but I'm playing with a lot of ideas about how to solve those problems. And I, I think that that will probably be a better mode. I mean, that's the bet I'm placing is that it, I think that will be a better approach to actually solving the problem. And what's really important to me is not introducing inadvertent um, unintended consequences that harm in the process, right? I think that that is another thing that can come out of solutions oriented thinking is if you don't think deeply about a problem and you don't take a minute to kind of think of the ethical quandaries that might come up, if you don't think about the worst case scenario of your solution, you can really create harm that you, you didn't mean to, right? Your heart was in the right place, but people don't know what they don't know. And that's another really good reason to talk to more people, especially when you think about hiring right? You want to bring a lot of voices from a wide background into your company so that when you say, I think we can solve this problem this way, somebody in the room, it, it, you're more likely to have someone in the room to say, actually, there's, there's a downside to your solution that you might not see because your experience has never exposed you to this specific issue. I think about that a lot when it comes to online harassment and um, mistreatment of people. There were people a long time ago who were raising alarm bells on online harassment because they were the first people to get harassed online and they could foresee how um, at greater scale, how big of a problem that would become. And it, it, they just weren't in the room, right? They weren't asked about, you know, should it work this way? Should it work that way? But they could have said, actually, you know, I understand we need this to grow really quickly. I understand that we need post to show up as soon as possible and that it's hard to moderate and all of this, but uh, this could really make harassment pretty bad. And um, I wonder sometimes how different certain things right now could be if a different set of people had been in the room for some of those product and solution discussions. Yeah, me too. And I also think it's, it would be very impactful to have had a more user focused approach at that time yes. too. Because I think even if you don't have all different types of viewpoints in the room, even if you try your best to have a diverse perspective in the room, there are still users who won't That's right. have their voice heard, right? So it's important That's for right. each person in that room to also be thinking outside of their own perspective mm -hmm. and think about the user journeys in so many different ways. Mm -hmm. And I know that you have a very unique background in that. What are some tools and strategies you use to have a user-focused perspective when you're ideating or when you're executing on a project? So I would say, so I'm in a lot of conversations around user focused things, right? And this is where I think my human development background really comes in. Um, a lot of companies will know who they want their users to be. So I've never been on a company in a company where this is the specific audience, but you can know that this conversation takes place where the, the people in the room say, okay, it's teenagers, right? Teenagers are our audience. I imagine TikTok thinks about teenagers as their users. But unless you have people who have studied social sciences or the humanities in the room, there's usually not somebody around who has really thought deeply about what a teenager is, right? A teenager is a recent child and a, an up and coming adult, right? And at the very least, right? And they're going through all of this kind of turmoil of themselves changing and their friends changing and their social group changing and negotiating entirely new social circumstances. And you're going to inject a tool that is actually going to be one of the pieces of software that they are now going to have to negotiate. And if you don't have anyone in the room to say, well, let's understand teenagers for a minute. And, and, you know, people also underestimate teenagers a lot. This is just something I was thinking about. They think that, oh, because 
they had these features on this app and this app and this app. That means that when I make something for teenagers, I have to put all those features into my app. But teenagers actually do not install something to see something they've seen before, right? They want to see something new. They want to see something different. They're some of the most open-minded, you know, um, people in the world in terms of trying out new things. So you can put something brand new in front of them and see, see what it does. And if you're going to make something for teenagers, you should probably talk to them. Not, not like um, professional, like not teenage, not necessarily teenagers who know how to code, but the teenagers who are going to use their app. Because I think if I look at something like Instagram and, and the way that it kind of fosters um, through social comparison and bullying and exclusion, which it kind of just scaled all those things up, you know, you're seeing more instances of body dysmorphia and even teen suicide. And I'm like, okay, did you talk to teenagers? Do you know what teenagers are dealing with right now? Because I think that you could have been more careful about this and, and more thoughtful about it if you had really understood what a teenager goes through. And so I don't know that that boils down to a specific set of skills but that's one of the reasons why I really want more people from the humanities and the social sciences to get involved in tech or in business, right? Um, programmers and you know, software people are very, um, very skillful in the how of, of, of bringing something to market and how could you make a share, photo sharing app and how would that work or how could that work? They don't always get the what to do and the why Right. And I think that the humanities, like defunding the humanities was probably an issue in this way because it, um, it lost a bit of the people who actually do know the what and the why for humans, right? And, and humans of all different ages. And so that's, that's what I think is, I think I see a lot of tech companies which choose an audience, but then don't really know what to do with that audience. And I would say it's also not about choosing a single audience, right? If you choose one person from each age group, like you're going to miss you know, um, let's say that your quintessential user is a 30 year old white man. Well, what about a 20 year old Muslim woman, right? Or, you know, someone with a disability or something like that. Consider all of them because each of them have different needs and each of them have different experiences. And um, it, yes, it takes more time. Yes, it's harder. I think it's worthwhile. I think that if you actually take the time to do that, your product will probably be materially better in a way that does get attention and scale and money, it just might take longer. But I think some of the timing rules are, are something we should question because they feel kind of made up that, oh no, you have to get to this growth by Q1. Well, why? Like, why not Q2? Why not Q3? Um, if it's better, right, we can, we can spend time. Things take the time that they take, right? And so making a good thing, there's no natural law that says you can make something good for that, for your broad audience in a year, right? Some things take, 10 years, right? So, um, I, that makes I, me, I'm very in intrigued by that because some of the dialogue that we're taught um, as aspiring entrepreneurs or when we're doing our reading is the lean startup methodology, which is to execute, 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 iterate based off of feedback and just see what happens. What are your thoughts on that perspective, especially if you need to, if you want to spend the time to understand your users and build a high quality product? That seems in my mind contradictory. Yeah, I think that. So the lean startup method is very much about that. Put out your experiment, get feedback right away. That can work for certain projects, right? But the amount of thoughtfulness I'm talking about has to happen somewhere. And it really mm -hmm. is best if it happens early in product development and especially before you choose your business model, because your business model is what's going to determine what your product ends up being, especially as your company grows, right? Because let's say that you have some kind of moral foundational values to what you want to build. Well, when the company starts to get to be hundreds of people, you're not going to have all that face-to-face -face time to instill those values in people. Your business model is actually going to determine what your product managers and designers and engineers are aiming at for um, their bonuses to get incentivized. You know, that, that will determine what incentives they chase. So you, you should think about this before you bake in stone, this is how we're going to make money because how you make money ends up... Um, really determining what you build. And so this thought has to go somewhere, right? And then it's just that the lean startup methodology is not right for every product project. As you can tell by um, if you were making an artificial kidney or a spaceship, 
it's it's not really gonna be like put it out there and like just see what happens. You there is a different kind of rigor, a different kind of care and experimentation and control and studies that you need to do beforehand to keep people safe. And I right. think that that is something that has been missing. I think that people have not um, appreciated the scaling power of technology and how easy it is to make something that doesn't keep people safe. And um, some people don't actually value the idea of safety for people, which is a little, you know, I don't really understand that or they don't think about it. They're so excited by what they can do. I mean, it's straight out of Jurassic Park, right? <laughs> which we've all seen. You, you wanted to think That's about what you can analogy. do. Yeah. yeah. You were so busy thinking about what you can do. You were so excited by it that you ran at that and you didn't think about what you should do. And it's just, I, I think that that is something that comes up for me better when I talk to a wider variety of people. I hear, oh, I didn't realize how unsafe this group was using this sort of thing. And what I, when I bring up medical or, or you know, um, a spaceship as an example, that's mostly to show that there is obviously a range of time that things take. And I think that in tech and especially in software, people seem to assume all software can get built in the same amount of time for the same quality. And that's not really right. You, they're, they're, software is often looks much simpler than it is because the code is simple and the building it is simple, but the effect that it's going to have on people, especially groups of people, if it is a platform where people are interacting, people really underestimate just how big of a change, the magnitude of change you can make in the world just by tweaking the way people communicate or something like that. So we have to let this stuff take the time it takes. Um, I think about this a lot with ethics in artificial intelligence because people really ran with artificial intelligence and machine learning and now the research and the ethics are trying to catch up, but there was nothing that predetermined that we couldn't wait for the ethics before we started experimenting at that scale. You can experiment on a small scale. So that's one way to use the lean startup methodology and if, if reducing harm is important to you, one way to do that is you can experiment on a small set. But before you go scale to millions or billions of people, let's pump the brakes a little bit and check in with ethicists or philosophers or, or psychologists and say, what's going to happen, right? Sociologists are very good for this too, because they have studied, you know, the, the changes that are made from what individual people do, how that ripples out through a whole social group. And um, that's why I want those people to be more involved, especially before that. So yeah, scale, we have an assumption about time to scale, time to market, time to profitability. Well, let's play with all that. Let's see, let's see what if we're like, okay, with not scaling right at first, right? What if we were okay with profit taking a little bit longer to get to, but we know it'll come because the product you end up making will be materially better for the world. Right. And you can create really good value. And then it's just about capturing that value in a way that is positive and doesn't like create any perverse incentives. That's really important that your incentives stay pure. Absolutely. I think one thing that you really touched on that that I really resonate with is that when we're first starting out, we're taught a lot to think about market size and how we can profit and make money and well, how, where the compelling business case is for the idea. But I think something else that we should also be really focusing on as aspiring entrepreneurs and people who are going to be innovating in the future and driving this next generation of products and technology is also the impact it's gonna have on the world. And I think that we downplay that currently. I haven't heard that from very many people, although it is something in the back of our minds and we use technology every day and to a certain extent, user experience is at the forefront of our brains, which was not before, even like five or six years ago, it wasn't very prevalent. So I think even to take it a step further and really focus not only on is this user interface like clean and usable and, mm -hmm. you know, are people able to do what we'd like them to do easily? We also need to understand is what we're asking them to do benefiting society in some way? What is the mm -hmm. impact that this is going to have on them or potentially mm -hmm. going to have on them and how can we mitigate negative impacts in any mm -hmm. way that we can. Um, I think even just those like couple questions that you ask yourself at the very beginning could make so much difference. It's like the butterfly effect. Like if you change something yes. in the past, it like has a huge impacts on the future, you know, so. Absolutely. I, the, the way that nature works, the way that humans work is you, you can turn a dial just a little bit and wait 10 years 
And then it can have this outsized impact. And tech has this more than anything else because of the scaling power, because it's so cheap to scale and it's so cheap to build that audience there. Science and medicine don't even have that ability, right? It, we're not going to send 2 billion people to Mars within 10 years of the first trip to Mars. That's just not how that can work, right? There's, there's literally barriers to that. But in terms of software, that's not the case. And in terms of content and media, that's not the case, right? And we've, we've really created something that is entirely unprecedented. And we're kind of experimenting and being experimented on together. And what I wanted to point out there is even, even following those questions, even doing what I'm suggesting here, you still can be wrong right? You still can have missed something, right? You can think, I, I have this problem I really care about. I set out to solve it. I really thought about my solution and I really tried to capture what, what unintended consequences of my solution might exist by talking to a wide range of people. But you, you can't have perfect foresight. There are unknowns. Your, your thing will interact with a changing world too. So sometimes you can't think about that just once. You kind of have to keep your eye on it and say, oh no, this new thing showed up. And now when my thing interacts with that, it, it might turn into something not so good. And so the way that I think about how do you continue to um, reduce harm when, you, when that is always a possibility is to start planning ahead. What am I going to do when I find out I was wrong, right? And, and am I going to have my business and my company set up in a way where I will be willing and able, I mean, this is including who you choose for your board, who your investors are, who your advisors are, because they will have get to vote on certain things and they'll get influence on certain things. It's what am I going to do when it turns out that the thing I chose to do is not aligned in its results with my values because of unintended consequences. Your heart and mind can have been in the right place and you can have done a lot of work thinking it through and you can still end up being wrong. So go ahead and think it through now. What's going to happen when I find out I'm wrong? Um, how can I... Maybe it's having more money in the bank. Maybe it's having a little bit more conservative view of development. Maybe it's slowing the pace so that you can see those results coming in before you go full scale, right? Those are all things that give you a chance to intervene and say, actually, we need to skip, pull this feature back because when we added that feature, it actually unlocked a, a behavior that we didn't realize had negative consequences. And I think one way to mitigate those things, you have to, you have to mitigate against like nefarious action and unintended consequences pretty equally actually because you don't know what you don't know and you don't know the like one thing that's really surprised well it's not surprising to me but one thing i really feel is that people are so caught up with the excitement and speed of technological invention that they stopped being so in love with finding out more about us and how we work right humans are not a solved discovered you know, thing. And neither is the earth. The ocean is still a big mystery in a lot of ways. And we don't necessarily have to go fussing with it all quite so much. And we don't know what we don't know about ourselves yet, right? We have biology and evolutionary biology and sociology and psychology and all of these models for how we think about humans, but they aren't necessarily incomplete. We don't, we don't have it all worked out. And so that means that there, that it's very easy to have unintended consequences the way that your product or solution interacts with the way humans work that we didn't know. Oh, I didn't know that if you introduce this to a big group of humans, that this would be the result. I think we're seeing literally that at, at times that people didn't think of groups of human as humans as the force of nature that they are, you know, we feel very fast. We feel more computery, right? We're like very fast. We're like buzzing back and forth between different devices. You feel like you're a mouse moving across the screen. You're not though, you are still ancient, right? You're, you know, you don't, uh, we, you don't evolve on the order of decades that way, right? Everybody, you know, that's just not how that works. And so- I think also to a certain extent, yeah. humans are always changing too. Yes. Because of the unintended consequences, we change slightly in the way we react to things and the way we, we right. expect the world to work a certain way, we evolve also in that way. So by paying attention to how humans behave in every step of the way, innovation can occur at that scale as well that's for that right. specific type of human. For example, some technology nowadays probably wouldn't resonate with 
humans in the 1800s, you know? Oh yeah, that if you go back that far, then you, then you have that far. <laughs> but I, I actually think I, I did some thinking recently, and I might I might write something up about this. I did a lot of thinking recently about all the software and video games that I played growing up. So this was in the 90s mostly, and then early 2000s. And I think there's a lot to learn from those things. I, I think like going back and looking at the software that we used when when I was a kid. Um, first, everybody's very nostalgic for it. I think a lot of adults are like, oh my gosh, right. Of course, I played Oregon Trail. Oregon Trail was so good. Um, you know, things like that. Um, they all did less. You know, they did like a couple things and they did them really well. And then they kind of just were, right? And it was fine, you know? And I actually think, I, I haven't tried this yet, but I suspect that if I put some of those games in front of, you know, nieces or nephews who are young, um, I think they would still appeal to them. There was something I read about about um, toddlers and young children who are who have been exposed to devices, right? They know how to work a tablet. They know how to work an iPhone. They know how to Google and YouTube and all of that stuff, which is always kind of funny when like these very tiny people are like swiping through photos on a phone. Or it's also very funny when they're like, hey, Google, turn on the yeah. TV or something like that. Yes. It's like, <laughs> yeah, there's something really weird about seeing little kids interacting with technology, like the way a, a, an adult reads their email. But I read that if uh, um, some people took some of these, you know, young children and toddlers who were very used to devices, the, the speedy nature of devices, these were kids were begging for phones and, and all of that, and that fast pace of the way devices work now, you put them down in front of a 1970s episode of Mr. Rogers and they love it, right? So we don't, you know, while kids and he, adults, everybody can learn and, and kind of temporarily adapt to use what's around them we still have the same pacing in our brain, like all of the machinery to go, move at a slower pace, it's still there. And I think it's actually underutilized. Um, I think a lot of good creativity and conversation and stuff can happen from kind of slowing down. I've had text conversations with a friend and text is really powerful and cool. Like as a medium, it's very cool. There's actually benefits of text that we don't get in certain ways because the way devices work, they make text feel like it has to be synchronous and um, instantaneous. So I get a ping on my watch or my phone. I'm like, okay, I got to go respond to that text message. But that's not how text works. You can actually take your time, right? You can you can I sit back, take some breaths and think about it. And I've had conversations with friends where I could tell that they were, it was kind of going off the rails, right? Like we were misunderstanding each other and it was going too fast and we were both impatient and saying like that. And then I was like, wait a sec, let's like, I'm going to just take a minute and go like literally 60 seconds of waiting can entirely change what you end up saying to that person. And it can like get you back on the right track. And that's something that is easier to do in text even than it is in verbal conversation. Even though I do feel that speediness applies to verbal conversation now too, you know? Um, and so I, I, I feel like that's, that's one thing. People wanna rush forward, forward into progress. There's so much cool stuff behind us that I think you could grab and kind of integrate into these ideas and like really, really lean into things that work really well for humans because that's the way humans worked for millions, if not billions of years. It would be so interesting if technology became like fashion in a way where like, you know, how recently the 90s fashion became. That's right. Imagine if like technology, all the innovation of every decade was like so unique and would cycle back and forth. Well, like. Yeah. Specific. It would like borrow from previous generations. That's right. Not necessarily like be exact replicas. Yes. But yes, I love that, and that's actually one reason why I do want to talk about all of those software and video games from the past because I think there's so much to learn there. Um, I don't know if you played this, but the games Mist and Riven were these open world. Well, they looked open world, but they were 3D puzzle games where you would visit these islands and it was gorgeous. It was this gorgeous gameplay that was like a little spooky, but really, really cool. I've never played a game that felt like those. And I can't, I do not at all believe that that would not appeal to people now. Um, and I know that that company is making other games on different platforms now, but you know, I, I think there's really some gold back there to, to look at. And I even think about the way that the early internet had so much waiting built into it, right? Like you would be playing a game and every single mouse click would make the entire page refresh. And sometimes because of the bandwidth that you had on your modem, 
that page refresh would take like a full three minutes or something. And, and you just had to sit and wait. And that was time to get bored. That was time to think about something, maybe think about some, how something works, maybe doodle or just wait. You just, and, and there wasn't tabs. So you couldn't just switch to a new tab and, and keep going. Like there's, there's really interesting stuff to play with there. One thing I want to mention is that I was like, I actually found myself like missing advertisement breaks yesterday. We uh -huh. were watching something on Netflix and just the next episode, it just comes too soon. Right. And mm -hmm. I, even though I can pause it, I'm not pausing it. That's so right. I found that I was like not getting something to drink that I wanted to get, or I didn't, you know, take a break when I wanted to take a break. It was like, oh, the episode already started. I got to sit and watch it now. Absolutely. So, why can't we slow it down? Why does it have to be five seconds? Why can't you give me the choice to continue if I want to continue? Like, Absolutely. Yes. There's all of these things are specifically built to keep you there. And mm -hmm. if you look at it, then we try to go solve that problem, right? So one of the things I think about, I think that the wellness industry, while meditation is really important and mindfulness is really important, we actually should be able to be mindful and kind of meditative throughout the day. Not like, okay, now I'm going to go set aside my 30 minutes where I'm going to try to get my brain right after the 23 and a half or, you know, let's say 15 and a half hours of wakefulness where I'd never let my brain rest. Uh, that's probably not actually how that's supposed to work. That to me, the wellness industry doing as well as it's doing right now is actually a bit of an indictment of the last 10 to 20 years of, social, of, of software development and tech. And you can see that instead of saying, hey, we should give people those breaks back, right? We, people should have breaks because um, they do need to stand. They need to go get a drink. They need to like take a minute and just be, right? Like, um, and not be subsumed by a Netflix show or something like that. Instead, now I have a watch that tells me to stand up every hour because literally nothing else is going to cue me to do that. And that's just piling up Band-Aids on top of things, right? And it's like, well, maybe we could just build breaks in, in a more um, real way. And I think there's, there's a lot of really good software that people could make to do that and think backwards and think, draw from history and draw from psychology, sociology, draw from mindfulness, but integrated mindfulness, not moment in time. Okay, this is my mindful time and the rest of the time I'm mindless. That doesn't seem Absolutely. right. Absolutely. And that kind of innovation comes from really thinking about the users and the impact and going That's back right. to what we discussed earlier, which is keeping your priorities really straight instead of really capitalizing on business gain. How many users can we keep engaged this entire time? How fast can we develop this? Like, you know, quick, quick, quick. Yep. Um, you instead focus on the long term benefits or the long term engagement that you might be able to cultivate when people feel good using your product and keep coming back and see positive results. I think yeah. we're too quick for that instant validation that, mm -hmm. you know, I didn't even realize this until we've talked about it, but like, it's not just like a like on a post or whatever. It's also like companies do it too. They're looking for mm -hmm. short-term gains That's as opposed right. to really thinking about long-term engagement and long-term benefits that people are going to see using their product, you know? Yeah. And long-term harms. That's the thing that's missing right. is that, is that um, a lot of the time somebody will do an A-B test to decide whether or not to roll out a new email or a new push notification or a new feature. And the benefit you're going to get will, sh like the benefit from that will be increased engagement in the short term. You can't really measure some of the long-term harms of those things right. because they, it's just not going to show up in your data. And at that point, I'm like, well, don't even bother running the A-B test. If this is what you want to do, then do it. But just know that every push notifications and email, I think, are becoming really bad it, via death by a thousand paper cuts. It's just how many emails do I get that I don't want? You know, How many push notifications do I get that where I can't go turn off that app's push notifications because I need them sometimes, but now they take advantage of that to tell me about a deal or a promotion. And I'm like, no, I'll, I'll come to your app when I need you. Right. You know? So I wanted to know, actually, I know you've been brainstorming in your specific area of your interest, but are there any other ideas or any other markets that you're actively looking at? Not necessarily for you to solve, but that you think the next round of innovation will occur? Um, well, I mean, so there's where I think innovation should occur, which all goes back to real human problems, getting in touch with what real people are really dealing with and not just what software people are dealing with because they are all ready to run ahead at the next thing. And that is a mm -hmm. big place where some of what's coming up, I'm like, okay, we need to pump the brakes and 
think about this and talk about it in public and make really clear to people, especially people who aren't computer scientists or neurologists or, you know, people who can't tell the consequences of what's going on. Um, we need to make sure people understand what, what could go wrong in some of these circumstances and have those conversations out in public so that we can make those trade-offs collectively or at least understand collectively what trade-offs we're making. That, that's where innovation is going to happen and I'm trying to make sure that some alternative ways of thinking about it get heard. But I think there's a lot of room to go back to just how people spend their time and spend their days and use new technology like AI and machine learning to provide tools that help someone learn about themselves and the way they do things. So the, my thermostat thing is one of them, right? I just don't want to think about what the schedule or temperature should be on a thermostat because that is not how I experience temperature in my home. And at any given moment, I am either too hot, too cold, or just right. And that seems like a computer should help me figure out the rest. That is how I experience <laughs> temperature in my house. Um, similarly, I've noticed that in between, I think there's a piece of software missing between Though I, I've heard that there are a few options for this that I haven't tried yet. A uh, piece of software that would sit between a calendar and a to-do list that I think is most similar to a day planner um, where you could take your tasks and get more information about those tasks. How important are they? How urgent are they? What would, what would go wrong if you didn't get to it? Like what are the consequences of that task slipping? And um, then it can take that, merge it with your calendar events and help propose a schedule for your day, right? And say, here's how you do this. And you could build in your breaks and your family time and your, your errands and things like that. And then um, you could use artificial intelligence or machine learning to find what works well for that person. So basically once you have events on your calendar that are tied to a task, if you add completedness to that task on your calendar, that also becomes a day tracker, right? And it can feed back in to a smart machine learning algorithm that could say, you know, anytime we book you a programming task from 8 a.m. to 9 a.m., it does not get done. So we're not putting programming tasks there anymore, right? And like, it would be really helpful for something to help me see that about my day and help me just have a better day, not for the point of capturing my time or filling it up with stuff, but to help me use my time better so that I can then use more of my time in other things like family or friends or social, other social things or other kinds of, um, you know, self-fulfillment that aren't task related. And that's just something that always feels like it's missing from my day. You know, I have my stuff I want to get done. I have my calendar that has my meetings. And even then meetings are different from pulling a task in as a day planner, because a meeting, if you're having it with someone else, it's more of a commitment. Whereas putting a task and say, I wanna block out two hours for this task on my calendar, that's more of an intention, right? Because things will come up. And then, so sometimes your day will have changed and now it should kind of like recalculate the best way for you to get everything done. Or it could do things like say, say you have some high priority, high urgency thing going on and you've said that thing's gonna take me 10 hours and you've only spent this long on it. And now somebody schedules a meeting with you the system could say, hey, you know, hold up, your, your task is actually at risk now because you're cutting it really close on how long you said that was going to take and how much time you have. Like that is the sort of tooling that I think AI should be used for is it's self-helping. It's not, it's a, it's a little assistant. It's not, um, you know, trying to figure out how to keep you on a website the longest. Like a lot of AI machine learning, you look at the YouTube algorithm, Facebook, Instagram, all of those things at TikTok's algorithm as well. It's all about keeping you there, whether or not that's what you want to do. And I don't, I don't think that's a, a good use of AI. I think that's, there's like, it kind of rubs me the wrong way morally, even though I know, oh yeah, it's profitable. I get that it's profitable. Yeah. No, I absolutely agree with you. Well, I've loved our conversation so far. Some of the specific topics that I think that I personally really resonated with were focusing on problems as entrepreneurs, really having a strong moral compass and utilizing that when evaluating your problem, specifically using your moral compass to evaluate how it will impact at a large scale, specifically because we are always thinking about scale, especially in entrepreneurship. The, one of the goals, although there are other goals, one of the main goals is to scale and have business value and drive and, you know, have profits and money and all of that. So 
if that's the goal, we should also be evaluating the impact of scale on just users and how Absolutely. they're going to react, both positive and negative, and coming up with contingency plans for when things don't go the way you're expecting or happen in exactly how you're expecting, but you're hoping doesn't happen, if that makes yes. sense. Um, Absolutely. And then I also really loved the idea of really focusing on users and slowing down um, and that there might be some um, fashion trend like technology that might come up, which is that we've gone through a real acceleration for a very mm -hmm. long time. It feels like we've been running at a mile an hour for just too long and that there might be some room for innovation and in helping us slow down, helping us live a healthier lifestyle that's not bandages or medicine, but more like healing you from the inside out, which mm -hmm. I actually really liked. So thank you so much for sharing your time with us. Um, I've learned a lot from you, so I'm sure I'm our listeners have as well. So thank you so much. You're welcome. I was really happy to be here. It was an honor to be part of your podcast. Thank you guys so much for listening to today's episode. I hope you loved our conversation as much as I did. If you enjoy these conversations, please be sure to follow the Pixie Dust podcast and tune in next week for our next episode.